Holy Spirit, we just thank you for what you are doing. We bless what you are doing in the nations. We thank you what you are doing in East London, what you're doing amongst us. Thank you that, that you're in a good mood. Thank you that you're alive. Thank you that you're moving powerfully in and through us. And bless our time this morning together as we continue to celebrate you, as we continue to open our hearts to receive from you. And as we do that, we just thank you that we're never going to be the same again. It's going to change our lives. Amen. Do you believe that? Yes. Amen. Amen. Next term, we are so excited to launch our AA Adventure Academy. So we are soon going to start putting out uh, notices for that. We're going to kick off with a prophetic course in a way that you've never experienced it before. It's going to come right from the heart of the Father. It's going to be anointed by the Holy Spirit. And it's going to be released to you in a way that's going to radically change your life, change the life of this city and the nations. So keep her out for AA. This was just a good week. It's been an incredible week. On Thursday, we celebrated, me and Jen, 21 years of being married. That was good. Thank you for all, for all of you who have sent messages. And then on Friday, we celebrated Jen's birthday. Yeah, it just, it's just getting better and better there. So, yeah, also thank you for those of you who are celebrating the mother of the house. Um, how many of you want to hear some good news stories? So, on Sunday, Tando came to me, and in fact, I think me and Joe prayed for her. She said, um, I mean, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Tando. She just released a book on encounters, and she was invited to a ministry, a church in Sri Lanka to go and release the gospel there. And so on Sunday she prayed, she, she come and she said, listen, I've been invited to do this. If it all comes together, I'll be f leaving somewhere in the week. I haven't got finances, I still need to get a, a visa, but I just felt God gave the green light for this and I need to go just stand in agreement with me for the, for the, for the visas and the finances um, and then I'll be back in the first week of April. And so me and Joe, we said, okay, well, we'll really agree with that powerful declaration. So we prayed for her, and I, I'm just so inspired by Dan, Daniel's faith, by the way. I mean, she's just an incredible woman of God. We've got incredible women in our midst. And in uh, any case, so Daniel sent me a message on Monday, Monday or Tuesday, and she said she had a dream. And in the dream, a pastor from Australia sent her WhatsApp and said, reach out and send your PayPal account details to this other pastor or this coach in the Middle East for that person who's going to um, provide for your flight. And so she wakes up and she's sort of half asleep, half awake, and it's like, was this real? Did I actually have a WhatsApp? And she looked on her WhatsApp and there's no real WhatsApp. And she realized, well, this was a dream. And she said, man, this is so, I don't know how to do it, but I love what she says. She says, I just had to be obedient to what I felt the Holy Spirit told me to do. So she sends a PayPal details to this guy, to this coach, to this pastor in the Middle East, explained to her the experience and left it with him. By Wednesday, this guy deposited the exact amount for a flight into a bank account. <laughs> and Friday in the early mornings of Sri Lanka time, she arrived in Sri Lanka. And today she's in Sri Lanka. I love that radical obedience, radical obe obedience. Um, on Monday night, I was on a, on a Zoom call with some of our better leaders, and one of our, our pastors, they just, um, they just, they actually in Costa Rica at the moment, in South America, and they said they were going to go and, and minister there at the church that they have relationship with, and I felt they needed to, they want to bless the children especially, so they prepared, and I got the whole church to participate in this, to prepare 40 backpacks 
for the kids there and it's got a goodie bag in and stationery and all sorts of things in this backpack and so they had gone on a plane and big bags, they have these 40 backpacks in a big bag. Went up to Costa Rica, they arrived at the church and um, they wanted to, so they joined the children's ministry, they wanted to start handing out these backpacks and they realized, man, there's too many kids here. And so like, oh my word, what are we going to do? And that so one of the leaders felt, well, let's just, let's just bless the little children. I think under the age of 10, or I can't, he didn't specify. But so they said, only the young children come to the front and receive a backpack. And they're like, God, you have to do something. And 50 kids showed up. They started handing out the backpacks, <laughs> handing out the backpacks, and they counted 50 backpacks. They only brought 40. <laughs> and then the, the person who's administering the big bag with the backpack says, Pastor, I think there's still 40 backpacks left in the pack. <laughs> so the pastor just said, any kid under 18, come and get bags. <laughs> come and get bags. So they hand out to another, I don't know how many kids, they hand out bags, and the exact same amount still remained in the big bag. Woo! Come on. We just say, Lord, right now, I just release his testimonies over us. Tando's testimonies, the testimony that happened in Costa Rica. And we thank you, Lord, that you just release extravagant blessing over your people. May this be a season of extravagant blessing. Extravagant blessing. <laughs> One of the cool things about this testimony that the, the pastor shares with us, he says, the coolest thing is that morning, we just had the urge to make popcorn for, this, for these kids. So they got up early and they made popcorn. So the, the initial 40 bags had popcorn in them. And he says, I just, I just was so in awe. I came so undone by the goodness of God that when God multiplied all these other bags, there was popcorn in them too. And it's like, God's even in the detail. He multiplies popcorn. Come on. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Woo! Hallelujah. Yes. So, so good. So, Jesus, do it to me. Do it to me. During our prayer meeting this morning, I felt God is restoring confidence to people this morning. I think Scott already prayed and, and he was breaking of disappointment. But I feel that God is, is restoring confidence, confidence in yourself, confidence in God and confidence in the church. And it might be all three together or it might just be confidence in yourself. God is That insecurity has been broken off of you right now. The disappointment of the previous season has been broken off right now in Jesus' name. And I pray and I release restoration. Angels of restoration to restore disappointment, disappointment in yourself. You are not, there's no disappointment in the Father's eyes when he looks at you. There's no disappointment, there's no distance. And I just break that off. Hey? No disappointment, Mama Norm too. Woo! <laughs> Amen. I love it. Mama Nomt always comes to me after, after the church like God's given her that word or that that I've already preached on. So that's good. It's confirmation. Hallelujah. So won't you open with me in your, your Bibles? In fact, before, before we get into Scripture, and good morning to those of you joining us at Facebook. We're watching our YouTube channel later. Bless you. Lord, let extravagant blessing break out on our Facebook audience too, those who can't be in person this morning. I've been so blessed. I've been so inspired by what's happening in the world right now. I mean, probably for the last month, probably six weeks, maybe two months, the one story after the other of God's Spirit just being poured out. There's revival breaking out all over the nation, all over in the nations of the world. And what I find interesting is that it's specifically on the young people. Now God says, I will pour in my spirit on all flesh. But it's, I find it interesting 
that he's, he, he's pouring it out on a young generation. It's a fresh move of God. I don't know if you follow the social media platforms. Um, um, Jen has actually been asked to write some articles on it just in the schools here in East London. How SEA meetings that has been attended by 20, 30 kids on a good day is now suddenly attended by 100, 200, 300 kids. And kids are just coming and giving their lives to Jesus. Come on, let's celebrate that. The last couple of weeks we've heard so many testimonies of kids just giving their lives to Jesus. And what I find amazing is that this move of God is driven by hunger. It's driven by a desire of kids who just want more of God. They are tired of just the intellectual gospel. They are crying out to Jesus. It is not driven by big bands and big speakers. It is kids ministering to kids. It's kids challenging one another, praying for one another, getting up and testifying what God is doing. And it's so important that we partner with what God is doing in this season. And what I find interesting is that God is doing it not just on the young people, but He's doing it in probably the most fatherless generation in the history of the world. We are currently living in a f most the, the biggest fatherless generation in the history of the world. And it's not just fathers are not there anymore, but it's also absent fathers. And it's a generation that are crying out for love and affirmation. It's, it's a generation who is so confused with their identity, with their sexuality. They are crying out for God. God, define us. God, we are desperate for you. The generation has probably turned to so many different things, and yet they are turning to Jesus. So Lord, we just thank you for what you're doing in our youth. We thank you for what you're doing in all of us. <laughs> it's interesting when you look, or if you follow the movie industry, that how many movies are shaped by the experience of or the lack of a father figure. Imagine if, if Odin actually loved Loki. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe if, if Loki had a good relationship with his father Odin, he wouldn't have tried to take over the universe. Because some of you need to just ask some of the young people around you what I'm talking about right now. But movie after movie, okay, maybe, maybe, I'm, let, let me speak to an older generation. Imagine Star Wars. I'm oh a word, where, where do we even start? <laughs> if Luke Skywalker actually realized that Darth Vader was his dad, if Darth Vader was a good guy, imagine that. Then Luke Skywalker didn't have to defend the whole galaxy. <laughs> Iron Man. Oh my word, Iron Man, Iron Man, he had the belief that his father didn't care about him, that his father didn't love him. So he decided he's going to prove to himself that I'm worth it to become the most famous, the richest, the most technologically savvy superhero in the universe. Because of a father issue. <laughs> Think about it, the whole, the whole Marvel industry is built around father wounds. Let's use a, a, a recent movie, Ant-Man. <laughs> Ant-Man, I mean, uh, well, okay, Ant-Man can get some credit. Ant-Man had some issues, but at least he cared about his daughter. <laughs> so many movies are shaped by this idea of a father or the lack thereof. Black Panther. Come on, Wakanda. Black Panther was a good warrior for this one reason. Why? Tichaka was a good father to him. Therefore, he was an incredible leader. 
Mrs. Doubtfire. Do you, I mean, a father would go through so much trouble just to be close to his kids. Movie after movie after movie, the movie industry is shaped by either a healthy father or a messed up father. And that affects the, the rest of the movie. It affects the world. Star Wars. Marvel. <laughs> so this whole idea of fathers is such a vital part in the human experience. And if I find it fascinating that God is moving powerfully amongst the most fatherless generation in the world right now. So if you would ask me, if I can fix, if I had the power, if I could fix one thing in the world, what would it be? I'd probably say fathers. Or fatherless, fatherlessness. So many problems in the world exist today because of this very issue, fatherlessness. The likelihood of the world becoming a better place probably by a large extent depends on this notion of fathers becoming present again, of healthy fathers. So do I think that the restoration and the healing of fathers in society will change the world? No, I don't. <laughs> and do you know why? Because a father can't be a father if there's no children. You can have a good father, but you can still have messed up children. Remember the story of the prodigal son? Or it's actually the story of the good father. He was a perfect father. It's a picture of God himself. A perfect father who just loved and his kids, and yet he had two messed up sons. He had a son who struggled with entitlement, insecurity. He was driven by performance and striving the older brother, and then you had a, a younger brother that was driven by entitlement, a poverty mentality. A good father, and yet two sons chose how they would live their life and how they would rel relate to the father. So fatherlessness, so often we focus on the importance of fathers, and it's important. We have to speak about it, but how often do we actually speak about being a good son? <laughs> Do you know why? Because God has given us this incredible thing called free will. The good father in the story of the prodigal son was a perfect father, yet he had two sons with free will. And so often we, we, we look at the world, we look at our own lives, and it's just like a nerve. When, I, when, I start, when you start preaching about fathers, it's like this nerve. And there's Spain. And all my issues is the result of my father's wounds. And yes, that is true. But there's also responsibility from our side to choose to be good sons. For us to choose that, you know what, I might be a product from my past, but I refuse to be a prisoner. And I'm going to start choosing to receive the love of a good father. And so this morning, I actually don't want to talk to you about fathers. Although I've got a few more movie illustrations <laughs> that I would love to explore. But I actually want to speak to you about sonship. Fathers are important, but this morning I want us to consider the importance of being a son being a daughter. When I speak about the son, ladies, I'm speaking to you too. And as my good friend Joe often says, great sons make great fathers. So, turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew 18. I'm going to go to Matthew 18, and we're going to also look at Mark 10. See, long before Ant-Man, Spider-Man, <laughs> Black Panther, <laughs> Loki, 
Darth Vader, <laughs> when all these superheroes, before they set out on a quest to become great. I mean, look at the Marvel industry. You look at all super, super characters. And by the way, why do you think these characters, why do you think this movie centering around a hero taking over the world is so popular? Why do you think it is so, it's like a whole movement, it's a whole industry, because it's wired in all of our DNA to become great. All of us, it's in our nature, it's, in our, it's woven into our, into our DNA to be great. No kid dream of being less. All kids, every one of us, it's in our DNA to pursue that what is called impossible. To call to be, we all have superpowers. We are designed that way. That's why we love movies like that, most of us. <laughs> Some of you are sitting there, I hate Marvel. I even, I've, <laughs> I, I've never... <laughs> But my point is, before these movie characters, before they set out on a quest for greatness, <laughs> there was another quest. There was another conversation that was held by, by Luke and Matthew and John and Peter and Jude and James and, and Mary and, and all of them were sitting around talking about greatness. <laughs> and this is what they said. They were talking about this quest of greatness. In, in Matthew 18, verse 1, it says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? That was before Marvel and all these things. Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means into the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. Now did you notice in this portion of scripture that Jesus never scolded, he never rebuked his disciples for this quest of greatness. He never rebuked them for their desire to become great. But what he did was he challenged the definition of what greatness looks like by introducing them to a little child. And he introduced them to childlikeness. He did a similar thing in, in Mark 10. Mark 10, from verse 13, he says, One day some parents brought their children to Jesus. And let's just pause here for a moment. If you're a parent here this morning, I want to encourage you to bring your children to church. Bring your children to the house of the Lord. And they might be, man, it's boring. I don't get it. And they're talking over my head. And I want to go to children's church. And I want to sit up here. Bring them to the church, to the house of the Lord. Because not only is his spirits attentive to what God is doing, but they also start discovering the importance of community, they'll start in seeing and experiencing things that they won't experience in your household. I'm just going to put it out there bluntly. You need to understand that your child haven't been given a junior Holy Spirit. Their emotions and their mind and their will is not stronger than their spirit. <laughs> and sometimes we just, we just need to be in environments like this. Soaked him in the presence of God. So they brought his children to Jesus so that he could touch him and bless him. But the disciples called the parents for bothering him. Hey, stop bothering him. He's busy with a great revival meeting. He's busy with church stuff. Don't bother him. It's not the right time. And when Jesus saw what was happening, he was angry with his disciples. And he said to them, let the children come to me. Don't stop them. For the kingdom of God, there again, he links the importance of children with the kingdom of heaven. For the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. And I believe what Jesus was trying to explain to them was that Christianity is not about doing, it's not about your intellect, it's not about your gift, your reputation, but it's about being childlike. And I tell you the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. 
Then he took the children in his arms and placed his hands on their heads and blessed them. I love this portion of Scripture. Jesus is, his fame is spreading. His TikTok account is just going off the charge. His movie reels on Instagram is breaking the net right now. Because there's all these little clips of just stuff multiplying, legs crying out, the dead being raised. I mean, it's just crazy. People are flocking to him. People are saying, man, I want to be part of your ministry team. People are, wherever you go, there's just hundreds and hundreds of people. This is a great move of God. The fame of Jesus is spreading. And so these kids are being brought to him, and the disciples say, don't bother Jesus. They've got nothing to offer. Let them go to Bible school first. Let them fall in love with Jesus first. Let them, he, he's, there's no value. There's no Nothing that they can add to him. And Jesus says, you've got it wrong. Bring them to me. And he was actually cross. It says he was angry with his disciples. Because so often it's like, man, it's so secret. And don't touch me. And, you know, this person is laughing. I can't focus on worship. Because it's about me. And it's about me and Jesus. We're so serious. <laughs> and God is saying, that I, all I desire is childlike faith. I'm not after your intellect. I'm not after your knowledge. I'm not great after your great revelation. I'm just after your hunger. And again, I'm so, I'm so provoked at what, I, what I'm seeing in our schools around town. The testimonies of what I'm hearing around the world. Started with Ashbury, but it's spreading. It's not, it's not lit and instigated by a teacher. It's children just, we are so hungry for Jesus. We don't know what to do. We don't know what it's going to look like, but there's a hunger. And I want to tell you, God always responds to hunger and humility. So what's the point that Jesus is trying to make in these passages? The that kids are important? Now, of course they are. Everyone will agree. Even yet, God adventure, we, we love our children. We, we believe that children haven't been given a Holy Spirit. I listen to when children speak. I hear what they are, what heaven is saying to them. So yes, kids are important to us and kids are important to Jesus. But I think the point that Jesus really wanted to make here is that he was speaking about the attitude of the heart. The posture of the heart. He's speaking about the mindset of a child that would come in innocent, purity of heart. Jesus, I've got nothing to offer. I simply want more of you. Jesus, I don't play an instrument. I'm just hungry for you. Um, we're not going to have a full band this morning. We haven't got a drummer. <laughs> We don't have a keyboard. We don't have this. But Jesus, I'm so hungry for you. All I want is to behold your face. All I want is to see your face. And Jesus was talking, I believe, about the posture of humility, of childlikeness, of wonder, of awe, of innocence, of teachability. And sometimes we come into environments where we are so, we are so experts of this is what a good church service should look like. Or oh, this is success. This is what church should look like. If there's an incredible preacher or the, the band is on fire or there's incredible programs happening and, you know, we've got the standard. We won't admit it, but it's like, well, I don't get anything about out of worship or out of church today. Instead of just, I just want to come to worship you. I've just come to give you my heart, because I'm so hungry and so desperate for you. So Jesus, as he took these kids in his arms, as he placed some of these kids on his knee, place of intimacy, of closeness, he says, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. And the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Who is those with childlike faith? 
And Jesus, I believe, was trying to teach his disciple to never refuse people coming to him with childlike faith. With simplicity. I believe that the greatest threat to Christianity today is people who say they believe, but they've lost the childlike wonder. They've lost that amazement. And again, what I love about this move of God is that it's driven by hunger. It's driven by childlike wonder and innocence. People who don't over contextualize it or intellectualize it, but simply we are so hungry to meet with Jesus. Where the focus is not about performance, but it's about pleasure. See, miracles don't create awe. It is awe that creates miracles. I like what Bill Johnson says. He says, what you know will keep you from what you need to know unless you remain a novice, unless you remain childlike. I'm going to propose to you that revelation comes from childlikeness, not intellectualism. If revelation came from intellectualism, the Pharisees would have gotten it. But the revelation of Jesus came to those who were hungry, those who came with childlike wonder. Jesus, we acknowledge that we haven't got anything to add to you. Jesus, we acknowledge our own emptiness and just came to you. So God is not interested in our knowledge. He's not interested in our self-sufficiency. He just wants to come to him with the simplicity of a child not trying to impress him, not trying to, to prove anything, but just the simplicity of a child. And I want to propose to us that the greatest calling in our lives is simply to be a child. Your greatest calling is simply to be a child. And I believe there's few things that blesses a father more than coming to him as a child. There's few things that blesses him more than just being secure in his love. Being a child of God is not learning to become perfect. Learning, it, it's just simply learning to be loved. And I feel some of us need to discover that love. Some of us need to learn how to receive love. <laughs> and I can see some of us already starting overthinking it. How must I do this? Is he trying to do this? What am I doing wrong? What's he talking about? <laughs> See, God doesn't, God doesn't, He doesn't measure greatness according to the standards of this world. You know how God measures greatness? God measures greatness simply by your ability to receive His love. Simply by just, Papa, here I am, love on me. Lord, I receive your love. I receive your love. I feel like Loki being abandoned by Odin right now, but I receive your love. <laughs> well, Lord, here I am, your son Luke Skywalker. My dad, <laughs> Darth Vader's messed up, but just love on me. I don't have to prove anything. I don't have to impress anyone. Just, I just want to allow you to love on me. It's as simple as that. So our challenge in life is not, your challenge in life is not how little you sin, but how much you can receive His love. See, the more I position myself to receive His love, all of a sudden that desire to mess up and do what is wrong is not that appealing anymore. Thank you. And all you want to do is you just want to protect that love. I just want to protect that love. It's not based on my knowledge. It's not based on my performance. It's just when I open my heart to receive His love, I open my life up to revelation, 
the revelation of a good father. I want to quickly look at another portion of scripture here in Luke. Luke verse 7. From verse 36. I like the, I mean, the, the, I mean the title here is A Sinful Woman Forgiven. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in a city who was a sinner. So this wasn't hidden sin. This is like they knew that this woman was a sinner. When she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought the alabaster flask of fragrant oil. And she stood at his feet behind him, weeping. I love that posture of humility at his feet behind him. And she began to wash his feet with her tears. You can see the humility in this woman. And she wiped them with the hair, with the hair of her head, and she kissed his feet and anointed him with the fragrant oil. Now, when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself. No, sorry, when the Pharisee who invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is. who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Similar response to almost that, what the disciples said in those other passages. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, Teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debt debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. In the context of that encounter with the disciples, it's probably... Probably those who have the least to offer you. And he said to them, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair, with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss. But this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, she is full aware of her sin. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. This woman came to Jesus just the way she were. She came to his sin. She wasn't sin conscious. She was Jesus conscious. She wasn't sin conscious. She was grace conscious. She was forgiven conscious. See, that's the thing with childlike faith. God, I, understand, I am so messed up, but I come to you. Not focusing on everything that is wrong with me. I'm not sin conscious. I come to you Jesus conscious. And I think sometimes we are so self-righteous that we can't come to God because I need to sort that out in my life first. I need to work on this issue. And this woman just walked right up there in humility on her feet. And she was just Jesus conscious. She didn't put the focus on her and what she needed to do. She put the focus on Jesus. And because she was Jesus focused, Jesus saw that humility. He saw that hunger. He saw that purity of, of heart. And he says, woman, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. So we come to God. Jesus focus, presence focus, forgiveness focus. And so how do we cultivate such a kind of love? How do we cultivate childlikeness? 
Why do we guard this incredible love that the Father is offering us? How do we guard this? Well, first of all, we can't guard that which we don't acknowledge we've received in the first place. See, a lot of us, we are still working towards love. Instead of, Lord, thank you. That I still need to understand what this love looks like, but I'm going to guard this. And I'm going to ask Holy Spirit to teach me, how can I cultivate this? How can I grow in passion and in hunger for you? How can I, love, how can I guard this incredible love? I'm going to give you four or five points. And the first point is simply this, just receive it. Just receive His love. Right now we are sitting where you're listening from. Just say, I receive the love of a good father. 1 John 4, 19 says, We love because he first loved us. See, a burning love for Jesus, a burning passion for Jesus, it can't be willed. It has to be received. It is not an intellectual thing. It's a receiving thing. Just be a son first. God, thank you that you love me. God, thank you that you care about me. When you wake up in the morning, wake up as a son. When you wake up in the morning, wake up Jesus conscious. Be a son first. Don't wake up as a teacher or a pastor or a son leader or whatever you need to be. Wake up as a son. See, our passion for Jesus will never grow higher than our revelation of His love for us. Again, there's no higher goal in life than to receive the love of God. So being secure in His love is one of the purest, highest forms of worship that you can ever enter into. So first of all, you re we will just receive His love. It's as simple as that. And then the second one is just ask for His love. Ask for more. In Luke 11, verse 13, it says, If you, who are earthly fathers, who are not perfect, if you know how to give, give goods to your children, and even in that you mess up, how much more will your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit if you ask of Him. So we push our hearts just to receive His love, but it's also something God, where God, I ask for your love. Every day I wake up, Papa, yes, your favorite son, just love on me. Lord, you say in your word, if I ask for your Holy Spirit, you will give me your Holy Spirit. I don't come, again, I don't come sin conscious, I come grace conscious. Just ask. You receive and ask. God, thank you for your love. But Lord, take me deep. I ask for great understanding. Lord, I pray for great revelation. Just saturate me with your love. Lord, without your love, I can't do anything. Simply ask. Papa, here I am. Just love on me. Just love on me. Every morning when you wake up, just say, Holy Spirit, good morning. Thank you that you ministered to me even when I was asleep. When you go to bed tonight, just say, Lord, as I sleep and I'm not, uh, my conscious mind is asleep, I just pray that you will just lavish your love on me. Just pour out your love on me. Lord, I want to be a sponge. Just lavish your love on me. Simply ask. And you will be amazed to see how the Holy Spirit start cultivating a hunger in you. A love of Jesus. See, being a child of God is not about what you do, it's what you're going to believe. My children are my children regardless of what they do. They simply know that they are my children. But it's the same with us. Receive and love. Ask and love. The third one is decide and love. See, we've been given the freedom to choose who will have our first love. Annette spoke about holiness earlier this morning. You choose who will have your first love. It's like, God, I, 
I realized there's so many lesser lives in my life, and I lay it down. And I choose to choose you and you again. Even if you have to do it every 10 minutes, you're like, oh God, I, I'm so sorry. I give you my life again. Choose in life. I love one of the testimonies at one of the schools a couple of weeks ago, this young boy, what, grade 11 or 12, he stood up and he asked for the mic. He went to the stage. I think it happened at, I can't remember which school. And he said, Guys, let's stop playing games. Let's give our all for Jesus. Let's become sold out for Jesus. And it's the same for us. We have to receive His love. We have to ask for His love. But we also have to decide, God, I'm setting myself apart for you. I'm going to make, <laughs> before I hit Facebook, I'm going to hit FaceTime with you. <laughs> before I do anything, I set myself aside for you first. And it's amazing. When, when you are, it's amazing how it incredibly God has made us. It's incredibly, it's incredible how focused we can become. If I'm hungry in a natural, it's incredible how focused I can become. <laughs> Why? Because I want food. <laughs> I become extremely focused. If I've got a goal, <laughs> I need to get my discovery points. I need to hit my target. So it's cold this morning. It's raining. I want to get on my bike because I need to reach my... I get focused. The more I speak about Jesus, the more I ask for His love, the more I receive His love, it's incredible how focused my spirit becomes. It's incredible how focus I become on His love and all these lesser loves become less appealing. You see, God, God will always love you. But the prodigal son and the oldest son, they weren't intentional about this. And it's so important. We, we live in a, in a generation where there's so many distractions. You see, there's one, it, it's not just a good father. But it's also I need to position myself. There's certain things that I need to position myself as a son to be in the flow of that love. I receive love. I ask love. I decide in love. And then also I obey in love. John 14, 15, Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commandments. And then I love the promise. He says, then I will send, I'll ask my Father and He will give you another helper. We all need help. And He will abide with you forever. So not only do I receive and not only do I ask and not only do I obey in love, decide in love, but I obey in love. Keep my commandments. If you say that I love, you love me. He's speaking about holiness. And if that's the posture of my heart, he says, I will give my spirit to you who will help you. So obey not out of duty, but obey out of love. See, that was the problem with the older son. The older son wasn't like the prodigal son who went away and messed up. The older son actually worked hard. He slaved himself away for his father. But he got he got resentful towards his younger brother when he came back. Why? But because he was working for love. He obeyed, he obeyed out of duty instead of obeyed out of love. Come to church because you love God and His people. Don't come out of obligation. Read your Bible out of love. You know, some of you are sitting, well, I'm, I'm going to wait until I feel that love and I'm going to start reading my Bible. I love what Smith Wigglesworth said. He says, desire leads to discipline and discipline leads to desire. There's seasons in my life where the desire is not there, but I'm disciplined. God, I thank you. I'm not feeling it right now, but I'm a loved son and I love you. And therefore, I'm going to be in the Word. I'm going to be in prayer. 
and the desire comes back. And then the last point is, just learn to love yourself. Just learn to love yourself. You are the only one who can stop you from being all that God wants you to be. Your challenge is not the devil. Your, your challenge is not your circumstances, your upbringing, what was done to you, what wasn't done to you. Your challenge is you. Your challenge is your own stinking thinking. It's true. The devil is not that powerful to keep you from the love of God. Romans 8 says, there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. No demon, no principality, no legion of demonic forces, no curse, only you. God, just love me. I'm going to learn to love myself because you've made me awesome. You've made me wonderful. I'm one of a kind. You knocked it out of the park when you created me. And therefore, I'm worthy of your love. And I'm going to learn to love myself. I'm going to stop saying bad things about me. I'm clumsy. I'm not good enough. Nobody loves me. No, I am awesome. I'm beautiful. I'm amazing. I'm going to learn to love myself. And when you decide to do that, the more you're going to start seeing yourself through heaven's eyes. The more you love you, the more you start to become who God has called you to be. A friend of mine recently made this comment. She said, the biggest form of self-rejection is refusing to be who God says you are. So I want us I want you to stand. I want to pray for us as we close this morning. I actually want to make one last comment on, on childlikeness. You know, sometimes kids have unrealistic expectations. As a parent, you will know this. You make a comment like, oh yes, what, can we go to America? Go fast and nice. Wow, that's a, can we buy that house? Wow, that's a, can we get that car? Can we go and get ice cream today? Can we, kids don't, Sometimes kids just have unrealistic expectations. <laughs> you know, it was unrealistic for David to take on Goliath. It was unrealistic for Jesus to multiply food. It was unrealistic for a missionary team from America to go to Costa Rica to hand out backpacks to kids. It was unrealistic for God to expect 12 disciples who didn't add a lot of theological background to change the world. But he did. It is unrealistic for God to usher in a new move of his spirit through children in school halls, in houses, in playgrounds, in university campuses, but he's doing that. More and more, I'm hearing unrealistic stories of kids becoming sold out for Jesus. It's unrealistic, but it's happening. And when Israel and when the world cried out for a savior, for a deliverer, it was unrealistic of God to send him a baby, but he did. So this morning, as you close your eyes, I want you to stretch out your hands. And I want you to pray an unrealistic prayer and just say, Lord, touch me with your love this morning. Touch me with your love. Touch me with your presence. Lord, mark my life this morning. What you are doing in our schools, what you're doing with young people, do in my marriage, do in my business, do in my neighbor, do in my city. Lord, I pray and I ask that you will give me the gift of hunger this morning. Give me the gift of hunger this morning. Give me the gift of hunger this morning. I'm so lovesick for you. I'm so desperate for you. God, I want more of you. God, I want more of you. Lord, increase my childlikeness. I don't want to miss what you are doing in this hour. Lord, I thank you that there's no rejection with you. I thank you that you're not disappointed with me. And Lord, this morning I choose to speak something higher than what I'm experiencing. This morning I choose 
to partner with the testimonies of what you are doing. I thank you for that. And I pray, Lord, that you will do it in my life. Do it in my life. Do it in my life. God, you're a God of extravagance. You don't just multiply that there's just enough, but you're always a God of more than enough. And so, Lord, this morning we pray that you will start to move more and more powerfully in our midst. We thank you for what you're doing in us. But, Lord, I pray for that first love. I pray that something will just shift in our spirits. You know, said that we, we know that He loves us. We know that He's here in our midst. We know that He will never leave us, forsake us. But there's something different. It's like when you get married, you go on a honeymoon, and that is blissful. But We've been married for 21 years. We know we love one another, but there's moments where there's just romance, where there's just like a wow moment. And Lord, I pray for each one of us who have a Holy Spirit wow moment. Lord, set us free, deliver us from the intellectual gospel. And Lord, this morning we come in humility. We say that we need you. We need you. We receive your love. We ask for more of your love. We decide to say no to the lesser loves in our lives. We choose to obey and love. We choose to love ourselves. Oh Lord, I pray that in this next season that we will be unrealistic and what we ask for you to do in our lives because you're a good, good father.